Tom Mills here, and I'm on location with John Godden. John Godden is our energy consultant for the Green Home TV Home Edition project, and we're just working through some of the energy pre-planning issues in this project. Tell us a bit about yourself, John. I've been an R2000 builder for 22 years, Tom, and I've uh, actually done a whole bunch of things around that. In building a house, I design it, I would design and install the mechanical systems, mm -hmm. and I'd actually be framing it. So I know a lot about what it takes to sort of uh, to build the house as well as design it. Mm -hmm. So the role you're serving now as a consultant to builders and to, to individuals, you come at that role having already built a number of houses yourself. Yeah, so, you know, nuts and bolts approach to it. Um, but I also know a lot about the emerging technologies and I can help people sort of find their way through the maze of all the decisions that they have. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no doubt that it is a maze. I mean, there's lots of choices when you start uh, wanting to look at building an energy efficient house. And there's a number of different opinions about what products should be used. Exactly. And um, so we've talked a bit about some of those different options. And, uh, but that's a role that, that you're doing for individuals and you're also doing that for builders, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Because uh, believe it or not, homeowners are coming to this uh, scenario fresh. Builders actually have been doing the same sort of things over and over again. And uh, ironically, they may not be open to as many of the, the new technologies that they could use. Um, having said that, homeowners actually are facing the pitfalls of maybe trying new things and it's very important to find somebody that is knowledgeable and you can trust about the decisions you're going to make because I think you would say yourself having started this process, the number of decisions are overwhelming. Mm -hmm. well, and, and not every new thing it really seems to be the best thing to do in, in a given situation. Yeah, and there's, there's lots of gimmicks. So it's not any different from any other sort of marketing that there's, there's products that have gimmicks and that's how they try and sell themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we're actually wanting to find is those products and appliances and processes that actually deliver performance. Mm -hmm. So when someone's starting out in this journey and they want to start either doing an addition or maybe building from scratch, what are some of the things that they should be looking at first as they start working through those decisions? Well, the thing that I think is of utmost importance, uh, we're all thinking about energy, but it's this concept of first fuel, that conservation, reducing the demand that you're actually going to be placing on an energy source is well thought out before you start. So if you, for example, use better windows and a more airtight building envelope and higher levels of insulation, you're not actually going to need a heating plant that, that's bigger. It's, it's going to be smaller and have less capacity and less demand. So um, I know as we've been thinking through our building envelope, uh, for us it has been, we've kind of coined the term insulate well. Right, exactly. And so this idea of first fuel then is really about conservation. Right, so we've done some preliminary um, analysis of your building envelope and uh, basically we've just run it through a computer and we've done some what ifs to see um, what some of the different building systems you have and basically your addition came out at about I think 18,000 BTUs which is probably about a quarter 25 percent of what it would have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. For the person that's starting this process they want to ask themselves what can they do on the conservation side of things but I know you're also a very uh, strong promoter in terms of education and, and the person's responsibility, the homeowner's responsibility to educate themselves well. Exactly, so uh, we're all used to getting free estimates and I, I just want to point out to people that um, a free estimate really didn't cost anybody anything to get. So it, it, it takes time and uh, I spend a lot of time with my uh, customers in my consulting business actually going through all the choices that they have and uh, again on the internet you can go on and get all the information you want but the key thing is actually understanding what that information means again there's there's many choices but there's how all those things integrate together to actually create the whole thing so 
Uh, it, it, is, it is a complicated process. It's, uh, a house is a very complicated thing to conceive. And uh, if you're doing renovations, you're basically taking something old and trying to make it new. So it's even more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that I think is important is conservation, but actually understanding the energy source that you're gonna use to, to power your house. So what are you plugging your house into? Where did that energy come from? Is that energy source actually efficient all the way through its delivery system? And I think that's one of the things that we talked about, that um, we were able to give you a scenario to show you the different costs of energy sources and equipment that are relative to the building envelope that you decided to choose. Right. Right. I'd actually encourage people to talk to their friends to see if people have had experiences with different things. And I think you'd be surprised uh, a lot of people have changed their furnace system. They've done a lot of work around their house. So you can get some sort of experiential information from that. Um, and, you know, just generally getting out there and, and talking to people, um, talking to contractors, trying to gauge uh, whether or not they, they do know uh, about the new technologies. When we first we first met and uh, I was talking to you a bit about this project, we went through a bit of a process in terms of analyzing um, what we had to work with and where we wanted to go and the goals that we wanted to achieve. At the time, we had a number of different decisions to make about different systems in the house, including the, the insulation, the envelope, the heat plant, etc. And the, heat, the envelope that we had, uh, had, had set at that point 2x6 construction with bad insulation had a heat loss of about 55,000 BTUs. We started looking at some different options because uh, we wanted to bring that heat loss down. We chose to go with ICF and uh, you certainly had some input at the time about that. Well ICF actually stands for insulated concrete forms and it, it is a great system for a homeowner that actually wants somebody else to come in and finish the shell because that's the hardest part of the job, is doing the excavation, getting the foundation in the ground, and actually building the shell so you can weatherproof it. So it's a great system that lends itself for an owner builder to actually get that structure up quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, then you as a homeowner could uh, think about doing your own contracting to finish it off. So um, it is uh, thermally efficient, uh, again, with all these different products, we need to check on the claims. Uh, some of the manufacturers are saying that, uh, you know, you can get our 30 walls. Uh, you're going to end up with that because you've actually, you're adding insulation on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the speed and ease of that system for you in this case is ideal. Well, and, and certainly I know from our point of view, Part of it as well was the air tightness that the, the right. ICF is going gonna, is gonna to give in that equation. That's a great point because um, sort of a conventional uh, wall cavity structure with the 2x6 studs you were talking about is more of a challenge to get the house air tight. And air tightness is that invisible heat loss that accounts for about 30% of the heat loss in a house. So mm -hmm. it's very important. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of our first major decision to uh, to nail down. A second one that came along then seemed to be a bit more complex, which was how to actually provide the heat into the house that we that we did need to put in. Right. And uh, and from that point, then we started looking at a few different choices. Being on a, a fairly large row property, we did have the option to go with geothermal. And uh, of course, the the original house had a had an oil based uh, forced yeah. air furnace. Our plans initially called for doing a, a forced air system again in the in the addition. Um, in the process, we basically completely reworked that and uh, have decided to do a radiant floor based with uh, propane as a heat source. So just to talk a bit about that, the the whole question over geothermal, there's a lot of information out about there about geothermal right now, a lot of promotion, yeah, totally. a, lot of, a lot of grants even. Uh, they'll give you some good money to, to put in a geothermal system. So tell us a bit about uh, about that option or about about that option compared to uh, natural gas or, or propane? Well, the discussion we had before was about first fuel. And so we've, we've got a thermal design 
that actually lowers the demand. So uh, a heat ground source heat pump is a fairly expensive system to put in. And so if we practice first fuel, if we practice conservation, we're reducing the load so much so that our savings from the heat pump actually take a longer time to pay back. Um, the other very important thing is about the selection of the fuel type because heat pumps basically use electricity. And there's a common misconception that electricity does not contribute to the burning of fossil fuels. So electricity is actually a form of energy, it's not a source of energy, we have to make it. And so in the, the analysis that we went through, we actually found out that with the better building envelope, we could actually heat with propane for, I think it was a little bit less than, than the uh, ground source heat pump. Mm -hmm. And uh, the system that we chose, the capital cost of that system are an awful lot less than the ground source heat pump. Mm -hmm. So we're actually winning in both ways. And uh, we've got to remember that uh, whenever we're doing any of these comparisons, we should be thinking about the operating costs of the house. So again, uh, the geothermal people will say um, that they're getting four times the energy output compared to the input. But we've got to remember that electricity is a very, very high quality energy source. And it does cost a lot more per unit of energy than natural gas or propane. I know that part of our conversation as well was about the idea of of taking that, instead of doing just one big geothermal system, looking at different fuel sources. So that when we started looking at adding solar into it, that reduced our, our heat load or our demand yeah. um, for the domestic hot water. The, the geothermal systems will give you a domestic hot water uh, uh, spin-off value, but we can get that from the sun. Right, and, for free. Right, and so when we do that, we're lowering, uh, it's gonna take even longer to pay off that geothermal system. That's right. So in that analysis, when we looked at the building envelope and reduced the demand that it was giving, and then even looked back at the old part of the house and found some ways to reduce the, the heat loss in that structure, uh, the geothermal was taking longer and longer to pay off. Yeah, and again, in the, in the right application uh, with a larger load, uh, for example, uh, you know, a rural estate house, uh, where the only choice really is a power line connection, uh, geothermal works quite well uh, because you you do have a big load. So you have an opportunity to actually get savings from that system. Uh, the other thing up here is there's a lot of uh, prevailing wind. So we have natural uh, ventilation. We don't really need the air conditioning, mm -hmm. which is the other uh, benefit the heat pump offers. And like you said, uh, we're getting about 60% of our domestic hot water load from the sun. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so again, it's a very important point about not just using one fuel source. When we get into renewables, we can start to use the sun, which is ultimately the source of all energy on the planet, right? And the best part of sunlight is it's, it's free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So far anyways, right? Yeah. yeah. I, what amazed me in that whole process though, was, and, and not to, to scare people off, but it was real process to think through, to analyze the different option. And, and then when, when we get into this fuel switch and the idea of, of contributing solar into it, yeah. the solar uh, hot water, as well as looking at solar air options, it just becomes a bit more of a complex system. That just took a bit more thought process and thinking through. So it, it is daunting. Um, so let's, let's sort of think about what you did. I mean, you started going to a lot of home shows, you started talking to a lot of people, and the real challenge is to actually sift out uh, with all the claims about performance and uh, the energy savings is actually sort of synthesizing that to a point where you can get a system that you can use. And it, it is a fairly complicated thing to do your first time through. So if you were doing this again, you'd have a great opportunity to, to know those things that mm -hmm. you could actually use mm -hmm. in your choices. Now, of course, that was one piece of that heating puzzle, the, the heat source. And when people think about um, their heating system for their house, 
they think of it pretty simply in terms of a, a furnace and they know a furnace works for ducks. They're not really thinking about anything else in terms of the distribution. Right. Oftentimes, uh, it seems that we don't separate the heat source from heat distribution. Right. And, uh, and so then that became the second part of the equation was looking at the distribution side. And we chose, uh, we're choosing to do radiant floors in that way. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting the way things have gone because a lot of distribution systems started off being hydronic. They were rad systems. Mm -hmm. And then we went to forced air largely because of uh, the fact that we wanted to get air conditioning on a central distribution system. And ironically, now we're back, but more into a sort of a hybrid situation where we're using radiant in some areas. And I know in the older part of your house, you're still planning to maintain the forced air system. Mm -hmm. So you can have different types, hybrid types of distribution systems. But the radiant system is, is by far the most comfortable. But again, people need to know that it's not more efficient. The efficiency goes with your heating plant. The way you heat your hot water, the way you're heating your air in a furnace, or you're heating your hot water in a boiler. It's the efficiency of the heating plant that counts. Mm -hmm. So as we've been looking then at the, the heating plant to go along with this, I know we've talked then about the idea of integrated mechanicals and that um, yeah. the, the original oil furnace that was in there we're going to maintain the ductwork that's in the old portion of the house. I believe we'll be using an air handler to accomplish that, to distribute hot air through there. But the idea then becomes getting the hot air from a propane boiler. And that propane boiler supplying the old portion of the house, the new portion of the house, as well as topping up domestic hot water. So again, the op opportunity with using the boiler as an integrated mechanical system, it actually heats hot water and sends it to either the radiant floor distribution system or to a fan coil that converts the heat in the hot water into an airstream. The equipment that we've actually specified in this house basically is an integrated mechanical system because it incorporates ventilation, heat recovery, into uh, the air handling system. So we're allowed to sort of use one fan to do a bunch of different jobs and we could easily add air conditioning to that. Again, it's, it's a lot like the scenario of a car. In a car, we don't have two engines, one to drive forward, one to drive backwards. We have one engine that's got a differential in it and gears and the same is true that the boiler that's going into this house, it actually modulates and we can get that boiler like the car to do our hot water, to do our space heating, and to do the radiant floor. So in talking about radiant floors uh, that we're gonna be installing in the, the addition of the house, uh, knowing that because there's no ductwork associated with radiant floor, there is then no way to move air through that radiant floor system. And uh, I know locally here, the building code specifies that if you're going to be using radiant floors, you have to have some kind of air exchange medium. And so we've looked at an HRV then to be installed in that portion of the house, specifically to bring fresh air in and out while recovering the heat out of that at the same time. So, so I should actually um, maybe clarify some things here. And again, what we decided to do in the new part of the house, which had the ICF uh, foundations and building envelope system, we're heating that with a radiant distribution system. Mm -hmm. And that's where if we don't have a ventilation system and it's in the new part of the building code, we're actually putting in a heat recovery ventilator that has ductwork to supply fresh air to every single room in the house on a continuous basis. Right. So indoor air quality is very, very important. Um, the radiant floor obviously doesn't have the, the advantage of having the forced air ducting system, so the HRV has to carry that. Mm -hmm. The other great thing about the HRV that you've chosen, Tom, is that it's, it's almost 90% efficient. So we're, not, we're only giving up 10% of the heat energy when we ventilate. Mm -hmm and it has a DC motor in it. So it is using, I think it's like 37 watts on its lowest speed, so far, far less than a light bulb to sort of power itself. Hmm. And again, we have a really, really airtight addition. We wanna make sure, it's a lot like your body, that we have a set of lungs in that addition 
to help the occupants achieve uh, maximum air quality. Mm -hmm. Now using this HRV, it also gives us an opportunity then to use some um, solar hot air contribution into that side of the house as well. Right, so on the uh, west side of the house, we actually have solar thermal air panels that might look very much like windows. In the winter, because of their vertical uh, configuration, in the afternoon, they can pick up a lot of heat energy from the sun. And we're basically running air over an absorber plate under glass that's picking the heat up and it's serving as a fresh air intake for the HRV. So we're probably able to get almost when the sun's shining about a third of the heat loss in the house from those panels. Mm -hmm. So 30% of the load. So this solar hot air panel that we're, we're planning on using there, uh, you mentioned it's going to provide a significant contribution to the heat load on the, on the addition. I know when we were looking at the, the previous building envelope, uh, the contribution of those solar hot air panels would have just been a drop in the bucket in that 55,000 BTU heat load. But now that we're at 18,000, it becomes a significant portion. Yeah, so before it maybe would have supplied about 10%, now it's supplying about 30%. Mm -hmm. And so there's the concept of first fuel at work. Because we're reducing our demands by having a better building envelope, we can start to use renewable energy sources to make up a higher contribution of uh, the heating load to the house when the sun's shining in the winter. Mm -hmm. Just underscoring this, this whole idea that although this equipment costs money to install, it's, it's a good investment in the future because the heat source is actually free. Well, and I know a number of times we've been looking at a few different products and looking at the bill associated with those different products. Correct. Um, and especially when it comes to solar then saying, okay, so what is the capital cost of this item? But what is the ongoing cost? Return, yeah. and, um, and it becomes a conscious decision to say, okay, we're going to bite the bullet on this, maybe a capital cost now, but it's going to reduce our operating costs long term. And that's really what this whole conservation uh, is about then. Exactly. And it... It has to do with this whole idea of making an investment in the short term that's going to serve us over the longer term. One of the issues that we all have in, in our culture is we see low price as actually being the thing that helps us make the decisions. Mm -hmm. So we're actually talking about a longer term decision where we're spending more money in the short term to actually give us a return over the long term. And with energy, if, if you do the math, it actually saves you money to spend a little bit more money in the short term. The issue with renewables is that we need to spend money in the short term to get a long-term benefit. And many people are only interested in the short-term costs rather than returns over time. Mm -hmm. Well, and certainly for, for a person that's looking to upgrade their house and looking even at the resale value of that house, um, not only is it going to benefit them now in terms of lower energy costs, but it also brings added value to their house at the resale time. And the really positive thing that's happened in Ontario is the Ontario Green Energy Act. And it actually is encouraging people to put energy performance labels on their houses. So. It's actually at the, uh, the discretion of the buyer to request an energy label. Um, so the more labels that go on these houses, the easier it is for people to be able to make a choice about the long-term performance of that house and how much it's going to cost them to operate over time. Mm -hmm. So all these decisions we went through in this process, the building envelope, the heat source, heat distribution, indoor air quality, we got a lot of different information out there in, in our own process and then dealing with yourself. But certainly, I was also contacting other people and, and other members of our team. We're looking at different sources of information. And certainly at some point, it becomes a matter of distilling the information, um, working with somebody that you can trust. Uh, I must admit, I'm a, I'm a bit of a skeptical person when it, when it comes to claims about different, different products and the products that people are working on. So I think that's a key, uh, a key factor that people, when they're looking at doing this themselves, need to look at who they can trust, who they're going to uh, listen to, who's giving them real information uh, versus uh, someone that's just looking to sell a product. I'd like to pick up on that, Tom, because 
that's a very important concept is to always ask yourself is this person trying to sell me something mm -hmm. or are they ideally interested in getting me the right solution for my particular project many times salespeople are trying to sell you something in order to make good decisions we want people that are more interested in trying to educate us so that's a great acid test for finding out uh, whether or not different products are good um, you can find salespeople that are sincere and that can direct you to objective ways of actually choosing between products mm -hmm. and the salespeople that are actually representing the better product it's in their self-interest to educate you enough to understand why their product is better. Mm -hmm. Well, and this comes back to our first point then, which is the importance that the homeowner become educated. Um, if they're looking to buy a house, get educated on the builder that's that's building that house and what the, the energy efficient features are that they're putting into that house. Or as a homeowner that's looking to do a renovation, uh, get educated on what their house is and what they can do to make it better. Exactly. So. The last thing I think we need to talk about, because um, we've talked about the importance of, of understanding or information, um, not actually making your decisions all based on cost. And ironically, the lowest cost isn't the best, nor is the highest cost. Uh, more times than not, I find myself right in the middle where spending a little bit more money actually gives a much better result. So, that's uh, that's been our experience in the in the pre-planning phase of this uh, of this project. Um, it's been really good working through that with you, John, and uh, I've appreciated your experience and uh, that you've had, and, and especially the fact that you not only are selling product and, and consulting in terms of how to do this, but you've built the complete house yourself. And uh, so, as you're looking for somebody to to work with your project, if you can find that person out there. Um, key in on them. And it might not be, as you mentioned, it might not be the cheapest person. Uh, it might not come for free. Um, but in the long run, it is well worth uh, getting that, that professional experience and background as, uh, as you start on your project. And, and I guess the other, the other source would be that there are many architects and designers that actually uh, could direct you to who, who those people are. Very good. Well, we're going to start putting the, uh, the plans in place and, uh, and get moving forward on the project. That's great. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you.